We are spending three weeks talking about what it means to serve the world, and these three messages are a part of our 2016 discipleship series. As I said in the, uh, the first part of this uh, series, that we are looking at the idea of service through the lens of gifting. We're answering questions like, what are spiritual gifts? How has God gifted me? Um, Where is God calling me to serve? And for that matter, how does our spiritual gifting and our place of service fit into our maturity as disciples of Jesus Christ? So here is the one-minute recap of what we covered this last week. If you were not here last week or if you want a more robust understanding, I encourage you to go to our website, lifebaptistchurch.com. Click on the media tab, and the full HD video is there for you. So here is the recap. We define spiritual gifts as the special ability given by the Holy Spirit to every believer that is to be used to serve others and build up the body of Christ. There are four primary texts in the New Testament that talk about spiritual gifts. That is 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, 1 Peter 4, and Ephesians 4. There's at least three classifications under which spiritual gifts fall. There are sign, speaking, and serving gifts. There are also manifestation, motivational, and ministry gifts. I gave six fundamental truths about spiritual gifts in general. They are, number one, every believer has been gifted for ministry. Number two, the Holy Spirit decides the gifts you receive. Number three, every believer is not gifted in the same way. Number four, no believer receives every gift. Number five, spiritual gifts are for the benefit of others. And number six, spiritual gifts are different than natural talent. We also had the one big idea, and that is use the gifts God gave you in the place God called you for the benefit of those around you. That's all of last week in a nutshell. Now, that being said, I encourage you, go with me again today. Romans chapter 12 will be in verses 6 through 8. Romans 12, 6 through 8. And today we are personalizing this idea of spiritual gifts. We talked about it in a general sense. Now I want us to personalize it, and we're answering the question, how has God gifted me? I want you to think about that from your perspective. How has God gifted you? Now, as we go through, there's going to be a lot of information, a lot of information. Now, that being said, I want you to know that the definitions, how I'm discussing these ideas of spiritual gifts, comes off of the actual words that are mentioned in the text, as well as individuals within the New Testament and one in the Old Testament who actually demonstrated that they have these particular gifts. So we're looking at their lives as well. Lots to cover. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace that is given to us, Each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that your spirit open our eyes, that you would allow us to be able to discern how you have gifted us. And God, you would create this desire within each of us to utilize that gift for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans 12 contains what's referred to as the motivational gifts. And we described this group of gifts this last week by saying they are the gifts that motivate how we think, how we act, how we respond to the world that's around us. In fact, they are the lenses by which you see the world. Now, as an example, let's say seven people saw a car accident take place. All seven would probably have similarities in their stories, but there's going to be just a little bit of differences based upon their vantage point and based upon their perspective. One person might come out and describe when it happened. Somebody else might describe how it happened. Another person may describe the circumstances under which it happened. Somebody else might say it was a blue car that ran into a yellow car. But if you were to take all of those pieces together, the cumulative information it should give a better understanding of the event that actually took place. The same is true of spiritual gifts. These are seven strategically positioned viewpoints within the body of Christ 
that help us understand the world around us as well as how we are to respond based on the leading of God. These gifts do not compete against each other. They complement each other. So here are the gifts again. Prophecy, service, teaching, exhortation, giving, leading or administration, and the gift of mercy. Now, this morning, I want us to walk through each of these seven gifts, and I want to explain the gift. I also want to take just a few moments for us to explain how this gift is misunderstood, how it's abused, and where it fits within the body of Christ itself. So we begin with the first, and that is the gift of prophecy. If you're looking for a biblical character to study this gift, look no further than Peter. Peter's a great example. Those with the gift of prophecy are the eyes of the body. The prophet sees the world through the lens of truth. Listen to how, how much truth is important to this person. They perceive truth, proclaim truth, promote truth, and practice truth. There is a misunderstanding when people think about prophecy, and that is it has some mystical, predictive qualities. That's not the case for New Testament belief in the spiritual gift of prophecy. In fact, the reason that's not the case is the word prophecy simply means speaking forth. It's not fortune-telling, it is foretelling. The prophet has the unique ability to sense and see indiscretions in sin a long ways away. In fact, they have an uncanny ability to discern when something or someone is not as it appears to be, and they are willing to take the heat in order to sound the alarm on that. They see what others miss. You put that person in a group of friends, put them in a small group, put them in a church, and they will begin to let someone know when the group or when the individual is veering off the course of truth, and they will call us back to that line of truth. We need the prophets. Now, prophecy is misunderstood in a number of ways. Uh, here's two examples. Prophets are painfully direct when confronting people painfully direct. As a result of that, you can also understand why they're not always the most popular people in the room. Do you know that little internal filter that people have that keeps them from saying the awkward thing in that social moment? Prophets did not get that little filter. In fact, they say what no one else is willing to say. They say what others are missing. They say what needs to be said. But as you might imagine, their directness can have them being perceived as unloving and divisive and even prideful. Prophets are also unwavering in their commitment to truth. Do you know how people say that every good relationship requires compromise? They would say that's stupid. Compromise is anathema to the prophet. Compromise is you just surrendered ground. Compromise is you succumbed to truth. So for this person, they're unwilling to relent if they believe that they are standing in truth. And as a result, people will think they are bullheaded. Don't point. Don't point. All right. Now, there are two spiritual gifts that collide constantly with the prophet. The first is the gift of mercy. The second is the gift of exhortation. People with mercy are so sensitive to the feelings of others that they are appalled by the directness of the prophet. Those who have the gift of exhortation, they want to encourage and uplift everyone so they feel as if what that person's saying is counterproductive to what they're trying to achieve. Now, while the gift of prophecy is a blessing, and by the way, it might not sound like it all the time, it is a blessing in the church. We need people who will say, this is truth, and we need to stay in it. We need people to call us back when we're steering off into sin. We need that in the body. But here's the thing. If it's not yielded to the Holy Spirit, the prophet can cause more harm than good. If they're not yielded to the Spirit, they have a tendency to correct people who are not their responsibility. They will get into battles in which they have no business being in that battle. 
They will jump to conclusions without having all the facts in place. And finally, if they're not controlled by the Spirit, they will reinforce a condemning spirit. Prophecy is a spiritual gift. It's necessary. It's important. But it needs to be yielded to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That takes us to our next one. It's the spiritual gift of serving. If you're looking for an example, Timothy would be a great example of this. Those with the gift of service are the hands of the body. The server sees the world through the lens of need. Uh, Someone with the gift of service has the ability to assess a situation quickly and they see issues before others detect there's even a problem. The person with the gift of service, they are not content to just know there's a problem. They feel compelled to solve that problem. They feel compelled to do something about it. So they're always stepping in, wanting to fix problems, meet needs, and make people feel comfortable. You'll often notice a person with the gift of service is somehow connected with leading social events. Now here's a crazy thing about the person with the gift of service. They can remember likes and dislikes like no one else. If they ask you if, how you like your coffee, and you say, I like it with one cream and two sugars, three years down the road, they will hand you another cup of coffee, one cream and two sugars. They remember details. They remember that because for them, it's a part of making people feel welcomed and cared for and loved and served. So they remember what everybody else forgets. Now, just for kicks, I want you to see how different the prophet and the person who's a servant are from each other. Prophets tend to avoid excessive contact with people. Here's why. Pointing out sin and calling people back from disastrous decisions rarely makes the prophet a popular person. They avoid crowds because they see people as problems waiting to happen, and they get tired of being the voice of reason in a room of dysfunction. (laughs) They will walk away from the crowds. On the other side, the person who is a servant loves the crowds. Do you know why? Because they are loved on by people. When someone knows your likes and dislikes and they want to care for you, they get that affection and that affirmation. They enjoy being with people. And here's the other thing. People bring messes and messes reveal need. Therefore, for the servant, it's like moths to a flame. The moment they found the crowd, they want to join in because it's a chance to serve people. Now, you would think That serving others doesn't come with a lot of pitfalls. That's not the case. If servants are not being led of the Spirit, they will sacrifice their own health in order to meet the needs of others. If they're not being led of the Spirit, they will overextend themselves because of their unwillingness to say no to needs. If the servant is not being controlled by the Spirit, they have a disregard for proper channels. For the person who's a servant... They consider red tape to be like nails on a chalkboard because red tape just interferes with them serving and meeting the needs that they want to get to anyway. In fact, they probably invented the phrase, it's better to ask forgiveness than ask permission. Finally, the servant who is not being controlled by the Spirit will interfere with God's discipline by offering premature help. Now, this one takes just a moment to explain, but it is incredibly important. Let's say a Christian is living in sin and God is calling them back to repentance. And in order to break that prideful spirit, in order to cause them to recognize they can't do it by themselves, God allows a number of difficult circumstances to enter that person's life. Sickness, job loss, items breaking. If the servant is not careful, They will attempt to meet and remove the very needs that God is using to bring about repentance. And unknowingly, they will interfere with the disciplinary measures of God, and they will often cause, listen to this, this is so important, they will often cause that person to have to go through the same trial again because they removed the pressure before God taught the lesson. 
Isn't it amazing how in each of these, and you'll see, if you're not yielded to the Spirit, that gift turns into a problem in the body. Now listen, we need servants. We need people to see need. We need people to meet need. We need people to show the tangible love of Christ to those in the church, those outside the church. No question about it. We just need servants who are submitted to the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, it runs great. Here's the next gift. It's the gift of teaching. Luke would be a great example. If prophets are the eyes of the body and servants are the hands of the body, then teachers are the mind of the body. They see the world through the lens of education. Now, those with the gift of teaching have the ability to educate God's people by helping them understand and apply the Bible. They simplify what others complicate. While some Christians look at the Bible and say, it's too complex to understand. The teacher looks at the Bible and says, it's too amazing to be left unexplained. And God has gifted them with a desire to research and then to share with others what God has taught them. Ironically, teachers may or may not be motivated to speak in front of crowds. In fact, some teachers are incredibly introverted and shy. But the thing that causes them to step outside of their comfort zone is they have this deep burden and a desire for people to know, understand, and apply truth. Teachers are also very systematic in their processes and structured in their presentation. If you want to throw a teacher off balance fast, just ask them to stand up and give a word. It doesn't matter if they've talked about a subject a million times. For that teacher... They are so taken back by not having time to prepare to wrap their mind around where things are going so that they can clearly present information that is factual and sound. Which brings us to another point about teachers. Teachers are ruthless fact checkers. They want things referenced and footnoted and documented because from their perspective, unsubstantiated information is heresy waiting to happen. So they want to make sure everything that has been presented is clear and truthful. Now, if a teacher is not being led by the Spirit, they are also prone to abuses. Teachers can struggle with pride because of their knowledge. They're often critical of sound teaching because it might have technical flaws. They are individuals who may bore their listeners with excessive information, and they may not be dependent upon the Holy Spirit, but rather upon their presentation. And finally, they have a tendency to measure a person's spirituality based on their Bible knowledge. We need the teachers, but we need teachers who are submitted to the Holy Spirit. That brings us to the next gifting, that is exhortation. There's two that could be biblical characters here very easily. Paul or Barnabas are both examples. Those with the gift of exhortation, they are the mouth of the body. The exhorter sees the world through the lens of encouragement. Now, just as much as prophecy can be misunderstood, this is the other gift that is really, really misunderstood. People think that if you are an exhorter, if you've got the gift of exhortation, then you will always encourage everyone and you will confront no one. That is not the case. The gift of exhortation, it comes from two Greek words. The first of those is para, meaning to come alongside of. The second word is kaleo, meaning to call. It's the idea of calling someone alongside yourself so that you can teach, instruct, comfort, guide, rebuke if necessary. In fact, it's that same root word that Jesus used to the Holy Spirit when he said, I will send another helper. I will send another comforter. The Greek word is parakaletas. It's that same exact word. So for the exhorter, they have the ability to advise, encourage, warn, and strengthen and comfort other people. The person with the gift of exhortation is all about relationships. They would rather have a face-to-face -face conversation than any other means or medium of communication. The individual who has this gift is able to discern where a person is in their walk with God, 
communicate with them at that level, and then help motivate them to take further strides with God. As with the other gifts, this one also can be abused. If the exhorter is not being led by the Spirit, they will initiate steps of recovery without acquiring the details of the problem. Their desire to see people mature means they will often offer help where no one's asking for their help. They will treat family members like projects to fix instead of people to love. They question deep doctrinal studies because they don't see its immediate application. And here's the last one. This one cracked me up, and here's why. My wife scores so high on exhortation until it's pitiful. So here's the statement, and I'll explain why it's funny to me. They tend to interrupt people because they think they know where the person is going, and they're just excited to share what they know. I kid you not. This conversation happens so much in our house. I'm coming home, and I'll say, um, today when I was coming home, she'll say, you stopped off to a store. No, I didn't. You saw someone you didn't? No, I, I didn't. I, I, I can't get anything out because she thinks she knows where I'm going, and she's never right. And that's the funny part about this. I mean, it's 20 years, and it's never happened. So literally, I read this description. I was in my home office. I read the description. I said, hey, Bria, I found a description of you. Now, she thought it was funny at that time. I don't know if she's going to think it's funny, me sharing it with everybody else. But anyway, so don't do that. That might not help your marriage. However, <laughs> the point is, any of these gifts... When it's not being led of the Spirit, they can jump ahead. They can cause some issues. Now, I want you to notice how these three speaking gifts now fit together. The prophet identifies and proclaims truth. The teacher systematically organizes and explains truth. The exhorter motivates people to obey and follow truth. All three parts are necessary. Isn't it beautiful how God has woven this together within the fabric of the body? Here's the next. It's the gift of giving. If you want an example, Matthew would be a great example of this in the Bible. Those with the gift of giving, they are the arms of the body. The, gift, the person with the gift of giving, they see the world through the lens of resources. This individual has a spirit-given capacity and a desire to give far and beyond any point of tithe. They see the ability to give to others, and God has given them an ability many times to make money and to manage money so that they can give more money to the things that are about the cause of Christ. Now, the usual word that's there for giving is didymi. The word used of this person is meta didymi. That phrase meta, it describes sacrificially giving of oneself. It carries the idea of sincere, heartfelt giving that is untainted by different motives. The person does not give in order to be thanked. They do not give in order to be recognized. They give so that they can meet the needs of people and so that God may be glorified. Now let me pause here. This is, this is a point, anytime you're talking about spiritual gifts, that a light bulb goes off in some people's minds and it's the wrong light bulb. Every light bulb's not of God. So here's the light bulb that goes off in some people's minds. They say, I don't like to give anyway. If that's a spiritual gift, that's why I don't like to give. Therefore, I am excused from ever giving again. Thank you, Paul, for clarifying that. That's of the enemy. That's a lie. No. And here's why. Here's why. Every Christian is called to stand and walk in truth. Every Christian is called to learn and know God's word. Every Christian is called to a life of serving others. Every Christian is called to encourage others to maturity in Christ. Every Christian is called to give their resources to help others and glorify God. The nature and distribution of spiritual gifts does not release us from the obedience of serving and helping others. It helps us know why certain people have the burden they do. It helps us understand where certain people fit best within the body of Christ. But we're all called to be those who give. Giving is simply an act of worship, obedience, and faith. 
So that's for everyone in the body. So I always have to stop there because otherwise people start running down the wrong track and they don't listen to anything else I say after that. So here's the other thing. Those who are givers, the joy of giving is not for the applause of others, but rather there is a feeling of obedience that comes from using physical resources to meet spiritual needs. They are painfully aware that everything that they have has been entrusted to them by God. And as a result of that, they are painfully aware that he is calling them to be a good steward of it. This person with the gift of giving, they don't ask the question, should I give? They struggle with the question, where and how much should I give? Givers also have a strong accountability when it comes to finances. The giver is so conscientious of money that they will often test the faithfulness of others by how wisely they handle their financial resources. You want to tick off a giver? Blow your money and then come and ask them for help. That's the, that's the moment in which the prophet comes out in the giver and they say, no, okay, don't do that again. Now, let me show you the ways that this gift is also abused. If the giver is not being led by the Spirit, it may cause them to give to big causes and actually look over some family needs. Those who are not being led of the Spirit may inadvertently put pressure on those who have less to give. Those who are not being led by the Spirit, they may fail to discern God's promptings to give, and they may incorrectly judge the motives of those who give differently in different amounts. And finally, they will often attempt to control people through financial gifts or the withholding thereof. We need the givers. We need the people that God has specifically wired to make money, manage money, and give money. But we also need those people to be led by the Spirit of God. Here's the next. Leader administrator. Nehemiah. That's our only Old Testament person we're bringing in as an example, but he manifests this so well. Nehemiah is a great example. Those with the gift of leadership or administration are the shoulders of the body. The leader administrator sees the world through the lens of order and goals. Now, depending upon the Bible translation you might be using, some of those will say leader, some will say administrator, some will say ruler. It's one and the same word. It's just described in a little bit different way. God has gifted this person with the ability to lead and organize people in ministries so that ministry is performed decently and in order, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. The word diligence is connected to this person. It says those who lead with diligence. That word diligence means haste in work. Here's why that's important. For the leader administrator, idleness and procrastination are the death gargle of an organization. This person has a difficult time resting because they always see something else that needs to be done. They are realist when assessing problems in the present, but they are optimist when it comes to talking about potentials of the future. Those who are leader administrators are extremely focused on goals. Even their goals have goals. They, they think in goals. They dream in goals. There's goals everywhere. And they know that big goals intimidate people, so they are constantly breaking big goals down into manageable steps. Due to their focus on goals as well as their understanding, being realist in the present, they also have their eyes constantly on resources. And God has gifted these people sometimes and the ability to align resources to accomplish goals. Now, the leader administrator knows their effectiveness will be determined by their ability to accomplish that goal. Therefore, and i got to say this about myself because this is one of my gifts, they tend to remove themselves from people and distracting details because it takes their focus off the goal. I've shared with people before, when I am with people, I like being with people. When I'm not with people, I will be a fantastic hermit. I can sit and think and process all by myself. You put me in a room by myself for weeks on end, and I'm happy like that, as long as I have food and a place to go to the bathroom. I'm happy there. 
But here's the issue. Because of that focus on goals, it often takes you away from the very people that you need to be pouring into to see those things accomplished. Now, the gift can definitely be abused. If the leader administrator is not being led by the Spirit of God, they will use people to accomplish personal ambitions. They will show favoritism to those who they perceive to be more loyal. They will take charge of projects that are not their projects. And they will overlook serious character flaws in order to keep a good worker. Finally, those who are not led of the Spirit will fail to give proper explanation and praise to people along the way. We need the administrator leaders, but we need them to be led by the Spirit. That takes us to our last one. That is those with the gift of mercy. John is a great example in the New Testament of this gift. Those with the gift of mercy are the heart of the body. The merciful person sees the world through the lens of hurt. So this person has the ability to detect hurt and empathize with people who are going through suffering. This individual often can detect hurt where others don't even see there's a problem. And when they detect hurt, they have this incredible ability to go and meet specific needs. If you've ever been around someone who has a true gift of mercy and you watch them in a hospital, it is incredible to watch them minister to people who are hurting. They can connect with people at a level that others cannot connect with. Now, here's an interesting just tidbit just for you to know. And that is when churches do spiritual gifts tests, the average is 30% of people in the church have the gift of mercy. I want you to think about this from a big picture perspective. The church is to be a place where broken and hurting people who have been ravaged by sin can find healing and health in Jesus Christ. It makes sense that he front end loads the church with people with mercy because we need those people to feel what others feel and connect and help that person become what God has created them to be. So the person with the gift of mercy, it goes beyond sympathy that says, I'm sorry. It goes beyond empathy that says, I'm sorry and I hurt for you. This person has mercy, which says, I'm sorry, I hurt with you, and I'm going to be with you every step of the way until you're healed. How is this gift abused? Due to the merciful person's heart, they will often remove the very thing God is using to create dependence. Now, let's pause for just a second. There is incredible value in periods of pain and suffering. Incredible value. Listen to the way James describes it. James 1, 2 through 4. My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James is saying, be excited when the trials come. Have joy in the trials because those joys are producing a patience. And if you just let patience do its thing, you will end up perfect, lacking in nothing. There's value in those periods of pain and suffering. Another passage would be 1 Peter 5, 10. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. When does that come? After you've suffered a little while. There is value in periods of pain and suffering. If the person with the gift of mercy is not being led by the Holy Spirit, they will base decisions on emotion rather than principle. They will cut off people who do not love others in the same way. And they will use sympathy to justify violating God's standards. Now I want you to pause there. We've gone through all seven gifts. Look back now at verse number four. It says, 
For just as we have many members in one body, and all members do not have the same function. In other words, God made us different on purpose. It is okay for one to be strong in mercy and another strong in prophecy and another strong in leadership and another strong in giving. God does not design it so that we're all strong in the same areas because it is by us working together that things become healthy. So look at what it says now in verse number 6. It says, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace that's given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. He has gifted you so that we would exercise those, use those gifts according to the way in which they were designed. Now, we've discussed the spiritual gifts, seven of them that have been listed here, the motivational gifts. Last week, we talked about spiritual gifts in general. We laid that foundation So what do we do? What's the next step here? I've got one website. We'll put it on the board over here. Here's the website I encourage everyone to go to this next week. It is gifts.churchgrowth.org. Gifts.churchgrowth.org. And here's what you'll find. There will be a spiritual gifts test that you can take for free on that website. Okay? I did it again this last week. It took about 15 minutes for me to go through this. Now, let me say from the very beginning, no spiritual gifts test is infallible. There's none of them out there that are 100%. Everything is accurate. But here's what these tests try to do. That is, ask the right questions to help someone understand how they are personally gifted. So, whenever you're finished on that, like for me, it took about 15 minutes, After it's over with, it will instantly spit out what your spiritual gifts might be. It gives a description of each of those as well as where that gift can be utilized within the body itself. So I want to encourage you this next week, go through and take the spiritual gifts test. Now you'll find that there are some gifts that are mentioned on this that were not mentioned here. And we'll talk about some of those again this next week. But the thing I want you to see is God has gifted Every single Christian, every single one of us, and he's gifted us in different ways, but those gifts were designed to work together for the health and the vitality of the body. So I encourage you, check out the website, take your spiritual gifts test. If you're all nice and brave, put it out on Facebook, put it on Twitter this next week. It'd be great to see a bunch of these gifts out there. There'll be a lot of people saying, I knew that about them. I knew that about them. Okay. It's fantastic stuff. So this next week, we're going to take not only those gifts that we've now prefaced and we've taught about, but we're also going to see how our desires, how our abilities, and how our experiences join with these motivational gifts to help us find the right place of service. It's going to be a great time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again that you clearly walk us through not only the fact that we have been gifted by you, but God, you have been very, very clear as to what some of these gifts are and God, where they fit together and how they fit together. So Lord, I pray today that you would give us the, the courage that's necessary first to go through and to take the next step, just to even take that simple test just to find out the basics of this is, maybe how we're gifted. And God, I pray that the next piece would be that we join again this next week and we begin to break those things down and find out how you have uniquely wired us, how you have positioned us in different places along the way, how you have burdened us in areas that that same burden is not sitting with everyone else. And it's because you have called us to a task that you've not called everybody else to. God, may we walk in the freedom of knowing that we are stepping out on the path that you laid out for us. In Jesus' name, amen.